continuing in our study of the church at Sardis. And what's interesting is when God starts us off in the midst of the, the seven branch candlestick, the book of revelation, the reason is it's, that's where the place where um, it's the idea that this is where you can see God. Like you're in the candlestick and he's in the midst and he's like letting you inspect him. That's why it's a picture of a circle of candles. Because if you look at the seven branch candlestick, if you saw that, I wish that they had a menorah that you could spin. Like each branch, you could spin like the double branch and each branch because that's how it was. It was a picture of wheels within wheels that spin. And he's in the midst of it. And so he's, and you'll see this in the book of Ezekiel where there's angels or anything else. It's a picture of like showcasing him, all the activity around Christ, like in the Hebrew language, is what describes him, right? Mm. Like, for example, the word for jealousy describes a activity. Like hunting to focus yeah. in on something. Yeah, yeah. Kanan or Kana is the activity around a nest. Yeah. So it's the word nest. So anytime the Bible is talking about a subject, it's talking about the activity that's around the subject. You see what I'm saying? You can sit there and uh, talk about a thing, but that thing means nothing until you're talking about the activity of it. You know, I mean, the behavior, how it's, be, you know, how it's moving about. And so it's, you're not going to know anything about God until you see his activities, right? When he talks about the arm of the Lord, he's talking about him, you know, kind of reaching in and making something happen. You know, so you know God by the activities of God. And the activity around Christ is how you're going to know who he is, why the angels are doing what they're doing, why are they saying what they're saying. So all this activity, and you're going to see, because we're going to jump out of the seven church at some point, we're going to immediately be thrown into the throne room. That's what you're going to see. So that's why it's important we orientate ourselves around the seven branch council, because we're going in circles around circles, like in the middle of the desert, you know, where the children of Israel, they're out there for 40 years. And it looks like they're doing circles. If you ever like look at a map and it shows where they went for this 40 years, it's circles. It's all loop-de-loop. -loop. Looks like one of those, uh, what's those? No, no, it's like you, you put the pencil in the circle. Oh, and spirogyros or whatever. Spirograph. Yeah, spirographs. Yeah, it's just, yeah, you know, it's just circles within circles. And you're doing these circles and in, in these designs out there. And you're going, what are they doing out there? But the whole time they're learning about God. Some things in life, it feels like you're just doing a bunch of circles, right? Like, man. But you're you're not just doing circles. Every you ever heard the group uh, Shanana? Shana is a Hebrew word which means to do a do a, a circuit. It's the word for a year. It's the idea that every time you go around, you learn something new. Very familiar, right? I mean, I've been around this before, but did you learn your lesson? Did you learn everything you need to learn? So you got to what? Go back around again until you pick, until it's time for a different circle, right? And we cycle through life in these ways and stuff like that. But God said, this is not in vain. It's not in vain going in circles. Circles is the entire process of life. Why do you think they wear yarmulke? Jews wear yarmulkes. Why do you think they wear yarmulkes? What? What? Circle. The cover, the spiral on the top of your head. The crown. Yeah. It's the idea of like how, how if you look at the design of flowers, if you look at everything, DNA, circles. So your hair grows. It's kind of yeah, it's, it's, it's the idea of a spiral. Everything, if you look at the universe, there's all this spiraling going yeah, on. There is nothing that is vain about circles. God has created the whole world in systems and in circles. Is that right? Planets, right? Constellations are all circles. Spinning those circles. Yeah, and it seems like, man, I'm just spinning my wheels. I'm not going in a row. That's a very pagan thought where life is linear. So, like I start here and I end here. Hmm. So it's kind of like the Bible saying that flat earthers are angels. We'll get into that. But, right, you're right. <laughs> no, no, the idea is that, yeah, this whole linear thinking is not how God thinks. God thinks of wheels within wheels, circles within circles, Gilgal, Galilee, Galal means to walk in a circle. Jesus did his circuit. He did his circuit and he finished his job. He walked in the circles he was supposed to walk in and then he ascends to heaven like smoke and smoke spirals in circles. Yeah, everything's about circles. Yeah, everything's in circles. So don't think. Uh, because you are, we're stuck in the seven branch candlestick doing circles for a while that this is in vain. You're picking up a ton of stuff yeah. 
before we launch into the rest of the book of Revelation. Does that make sense? When you are stuck somewhere in life, like for me, I'm just going, when is he going to get me off the bench? Put me in the game was my motto. Come on, coach. You have every knucklehead on the field but me. But God said, no, you're going to be doing circles for a while. How many, like, how many bullpen, you know, pitches do I got to do? How much warm up do I got to do? God says, no, more circles, Dave. More circles, more circles, more circles, circles and circles and circles. What do you learn in circles? You know, it's funny how rehearsing, right? They call it rehearsing. What's rehearsing? And so people that are rehearsed versus people that are not rehearsed, what's the difference? It's a big difference. People that practice versus people that don't practice, what's the difference? One knows, one doesn't. My son just came home with trumpet. Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, boy, big, big difference. Uh huh. What? Why? He's trying to. He's trying to trumpet. But he has the um. Yeah. And so the more he practices, the more he circuits around, and the more we learn about God in things that we think are fundamental to us. We think, well, this is basics. But God says, yeah, well, we got to go over the basics. That's where you hear in the book of, of Isaiah, it says, you have to study the Bible line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, right? And so if you, I wish I could speak the Hebrew of that phrase, but it's a nursery rhyme. And it sounds a lot like, Da 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 da. What is that? A B C D E F G H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y and Z. Now I know my. This is embarrassing. Stop, you guys. Don't stop, please. We're on live right now. Yeah. So it's that's what it is that. When God, a lot of people are just thinking, oh, it's a good technique for studying the Bible. We don't understand. He's saying, we've got to go back to the basics, guys. Like, so when a prophet is rebuking God's people and he starts saying, it was, it was, you start at three years old in Hebrew school. You heard of the word Hanukkah? Mm -hmm. Hanukkah. What does Hanukkah mean? To dedicate, to devote. And it's the idea to anoint the lips with honey. Because, right, when we talked about right. when you get something right. Yeah. And even today, they put a piece of candy on your Torah, you know, or your Tanakh. Like if you're in Hebrew, like if you're learning the Bible and you get something right, they put a piece of candy on there. And so it, it, it incentivizes your learning, right? That's why manna tasted like honey. God was incentivizing these circles. Oh, okay. It's, so that's the word Hanukkah. And he gets you to dedicate, to devote. Until you, that's where even the word uh, um, ana, right? Hanak, ana, to afflict. It's God putting you in these circles over and over and over and over again until, wow, I really get it now. I got it. And so when a prophet rebukes the people of God and he starts singing line upon line, precept upon pre, like they all knew that nursery rhyme. That was from the age of three on, you learned that nursery rhyme. And he was insulting them. It's like me going to a Bible study and the pastor's way off into his speculative stuff. And I'm all like, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. I'm like, well, how dare you? How dare you? Because, they, you know, like back to the base. You forgot the basics, bro. You're way off into this esoteric speculative kind of stuff. And that's what you're going to see even in this study. Like, this is fundamental basic stuff. When the Bible, and we're going to get into this in Sardis, talks about a thief in the night, they all knew what that meant. It didn't mean that God's going to secretly come and snatch you away. There's going to be this kind of, that's American escapism. That's not a doctrine. The doctrine of coming in a thief in the night in a Bedouin culture, that's more like Matthew 25, where the bridegroom shows up in the middle of the night. And do you know what they used to do as a tradition out there? Like, if, if I was going to go get Lauren, she's like, you know, part of this Bedouin tribe. If I want to go and marry her, I come up with my buddies all riding up on horses in the middle of the knife and, and, and her girlfriends that are kind of protecting her in the tent saying, he's coming, he's coming. And I come in with my steed and my long hair and I come and I snatch my bride. And, and there are those that are ready and those that are not ready, right? 
Yeah, you kidnap him. And she's like, oh my, he's taking me away to the lair. <laughs> you know oh what I mean? Gosh, mm-hmm. You like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's this idea of you come and you, it's a dramatic snatching because it's the idea of you're, I'm snatching away from this home. Plunder, are you guys ready for this? This is where the pirates get this idea from. Because the pirates were all Islamic. They're all from Bedouin kind of desert people. A lot of people didn't know. That's why they dressed the way they did, right? They're all dressed like Muslims because they were. With the, you know, how they were dressed, just, you know, with all that. That's all Muslim wear. And so they, the idea of plunder and having long hair and all this kind of stuff is the idea of that's what a young man does. He is a gifted plunderer. Man, he shows up and he snatches everything and nobody can stop him. And everyone goes, oh, wow, he's so dramatic. He's, he's a, we would call him a stud or a steed or a Mustang or a Maverick or a Bronco, right? He just comes in and nobody stops him. And everyone's like, oh, that bad boy. <laughs> hmm, Jack Sparrow, All right. Like, I'm going to take this ship and like, you can't, like, you know, he's just coming in and snatching it. And God has this, I, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to get in trouble by deep theologians, but God has a swashbuckling side to him. He comes in dramatically and takes what he wants because in the end, he's God. And you're going to see in the scripture that he comes in and he considers it a virtue, like David, to take that lamb from the mouth of a lion, to take that lamb from the mouth of a bear and say, that's right, I'm a thief in the night, bro. You can't do anything about it, right? Right? That God has that part to him, and it's pretty cool. So when the grave and death and Satan in this world sees you as its captive, God comes in on his rope, swing it in, you know, minus the eye patch and missing tooth, and snatches us away and going, (laughs) there's nothing you can do about it, right? And it's pretty cool because he's coming for his wife. And he considers her the prized object of his great plundering. He's plundering the grave. He's plundering, man. And he's getting his riches. That's right. And it's very dramatic. The work he's doing as a savior is super dramatic. It's astonishing. When when a band of thieves comes in the middle of the night, they just come and raid a village. It's whoa, it's pandemonium. And that's what you're going to see. And through the scripture, I'm just describing it. Then we're going to read read all the scriptures, and that will be the context. Is the is the pandemonium that happens when he just comes in dramatically with his troops? We, we talked about that on last week. Yeah. If you think like the swords yeah. are going to come from nuclear facilities and helping him down, the sword, that's yeah. what's going to happen. The swords. The- oh, the swords. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. All right, let's go into our studies. <laughs> Let's get into our size. It could be. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. We're going to have to kind of. Revelation chapter 3. Yeah, chapter 3, and we're still in Sardis. And let's go through. Let me see. Let me put it up on my uh, show on the stream. <laughs> Hold on. Let me. Uh... All right. Verses 3 through 5. Who would like to read? Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even the stars, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with you in white, for they are worthy. And you'll see the thief in garments. You'll see this theme weirdly kind of be throughout, but go ahead, go to Revelation chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. You're going to see this theme throughout this swashbuckling startling moment of suddenly all of a sudden everything appears tranquil and suddenness happens verses 15 through 18. look i come like a thief blessed is the one who stays awake and remains closed closed so as not see the garment thief thing you guys go ahead so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed then they gather the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne, saying, It is done. Then there was, 
There came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like this. It had ever occurred since mankind had been on earth. So tremendous was the faith. Wow. Pretty dramatic, isn't it? <laughs> Startling. When we get into Peter and Matthew and Luke, it will be a stark, sudden, horrific, chaotic scene of a plundering that's happening as if a band of thieves have just raided in the middle of the night. That's what you're going to see. It's very dramatic. And this, they call it, as you see here, the great word Armageddon. Now, Armageddon, in, in old language, they weren't afraid to compound words together. Like the word Israel is three words. Isha, like, right? Man. Um, sar, which is prince. And the idea of uh, El, Israel, is the idea of prevailing with God. Or, or you, you are a prince who is, who is in battle prevailing with God. So they compound words to, and this word Armageddon is a compound word. It's har, we get the word mountain, right? Moyed is to gather and gets, which means at the end. It's gathering at the end at the mountain. And what is this mountain? It's when God gathers everything around him and says, I'm going to judge. See, it's kind of like a court proceeding where God says, okay, everyone is summons to the judge and he's going to judge. And so this is a very dramatic thing. When it's a hard moy it gets, everyone's hair is sticking straight up or falling out. It's a horrific thing going, uh-oh, whoa, he's going to suddenly begin the judicial proceedings. And it's going to be sheep, goats, mark, seal, unrighteous, righteous. It's, it's, it's going in two ways. There's the galvanized process, you know, where you have two camps. And that's a part of a big scripture theme we'll get into later on in our studies called uh, the Machanayim, where God has two camps. And he's trying to tell you the plan of salvation is he takes two camps and makes them one. We, by nature, are in the enemy's camp, is what he's trying to say. By nature, you're my enemy. You're in sin. You're against me. You do what Satan tells you to do. I mean, you're just natural porn killers, right? You're a psychotronic killing machine that if I showed up, it would be a chihuahua with barbecue sauce around a St. Bernard being torn to pieces. Like, you guys are not my friends. I keep calling you friends, but why are you beating me up and tearing me to pieces and crucifying me if I'm such your buddy, right? It'd be like, you know, you're trying to hang out with somebody and they're they're jumping you and beating you up and, and humiliating you and going, we're friends, right? Like, what's going on here? Like, I don't get it. And so God is just trying to say, well, <clears throat> by what I do in my work of redemption, I'm going to take the two camps. I'm going to make them one. But in the end, he's going to, he is going to separate two camps and he will not reconcile the one. He will judge the one. And it says in the scriptures that you will also be judging with him. That is for sure. That's not me. It says you'll judge angels. You'll be a part of the judgment party. You will sit there as judges. So he says, be careful judging too early now. Don't judge before the time, because believe me, you will have your time to judge, and it won't be a picnic, because when you judge, it's going to be the death sentence. They are going to pay for their sins. So it's like, beware. Right now, it's reaching people, joining people to Christ, everything you can, because we have a hard way it gets coming, and it's no joke, right? That makes sense? So go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Second Peter three. So read verses three, just on down. And what you're going to see is a suddenness. Everyone's going to think that everything is just, it is as it always is. Nothing's going to change. I don't see any big change. What's the big deal? And then suddenly, suddenly, do not forget that peace and safety. Suddenly. Don't worry. Everything's going to stay the same. Everyone keeps acting like things. Uh, big, 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 big. Suddenly. Just like Noah. Yeah. Well, Suddenly. that's, you're going to see this because Noah's going to be a big part of our story here. All right. Second Peter chapter three, verse three, start reading. Who wants to read? All right. Go ahead, Paige. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own beings. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, Everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. 
But they deliberately forgot that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By, Keep reading. by these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word that the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Wow, is that pretty dramatic? The very thing that they thought that we have a total constancy in this world. Everything just kind of goes the same, goes the same, goes the same. God says, guess what? Those very things, the waters and stuff you see here, that's going to actually be what I'm going to use to judge you. But go ahead. Keep reading. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slowly keeping his promise, as some understood slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with the war, the elements will be stored by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Wow, that's the thief. Pretty dramatic. Yeah. The whole elements melt with fervent heat. It says in other scripture that the that the hills will melt. People that will be standing in their place. What is it? Is it, is it uh, Amos or Joel where it says their eyeball? No, I think it's Zechariah where their eyeballs will melt in their sockets while they're looking at I mean, this is horrific. This is no joke. It all of a sudden, eat, drink, be merry, don't worry, everything is what it is, live for today, etc. Then suddenly, and every eye shall see him, and it is going to be an astonishment. It says some faces are going to go black, some faces are going to go pale. They're going to, what are they going to do? They're going to say, they're going to run to the mountains and say, rocks do what? Fall on us. Hide us from him. Why? Because he knows the hearts of all men. So the gospel is giving you a preview of that so you can make decisions now. The world lives in darkness. That's why it's a thief in the night. To them, it's sudden. To us, we're watching and we're waiting. That's the whole part of being a Christian is you have the foreknowledge. So you are watching and you're waiting. You're anticipating. You're making yourself ready. Remember the, the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, what made the wise wise? The oil, right? And the lamp. And they were, is this idea of they were watching, they're waiting, they're in anticipation. They fell asleep, but they listened to the call saying, He's coming. And that's what's happening now. I believe that God is sending the Holy Spirit to start move upon Christians, Christian ministries, teaching those that open up the scripture saying, Get ready. You see the things that's happening now? This is just the beginning of troubles, beginning of woes. This means your redemption is drawing very near. What wasn't it I always say that continual thoughts of evil? Yeah, unstop. God strove upon them. God fights for your heart. And we're going to get into that, actually, because the big part of the study is Noah's flood. Because the idea is God is push, striving on your heart. And right now we have the privilege of, nah, don't bother me. It's the idea of a dove that flies and comes back, which, you know how pigeons, you chase them away, they kind of come back in some weird way. Yeah. Like I was in Italy in San Marcos Square, and it's just nothing but like a sea of pigeons, right? And then you walk, and they kind of move, and then they go right back. Yeah. And that's why God kind of yeah, shows you know the whole dove idea. It's like you kind of chase them away, they come back. Eventually, you chase them enough, they'll go. And God says, well, that's me. I'm going to keep coming back until eventually I realize you don't want me. God forbid. So go ahead. Keep reading. I'm sorry. Go ahead. If everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and see its coming. The day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Right. Stop. Friends. That's good right there. That's great. You see that? With this in mind, what kind of people ought you to be? Now that you know this, maybe we should take it serious saying, get ready, because guess what? The bridegroom's coming, and he wants his wife. And it's a dramatic plundering, right, that we talked about. He's coming for his wife, so she should be getting herself ready. She should not be at her worst right now. This is a time like, how much preparation does a bride take before her wedding day? Yeah, there's whole movies about it, right? And it's very intense, right? I mean, I remember I was uh, a part of a wedding party, and 
she was like going through so much to get herself ready. And I mean, it was like weeks, right? She's on the diet. She's doing everything right. And I'll never forget where she's starting to get woozy up there and she's doing this and, her, and I kid you not. So one of the uh, kids that was there <clears throat> grabs this bowl with tons of cotton in it and she vomits all of this green stuff. Cause I guess she was eating mints all the time and not eating. So her breath would be nice. And she passed out at the altar. And I felt so bad for her because that day was so important that she wanted everything to be so perfect. The irony was, <laughs> you know, she overdid it. Right. But do you see the intensity? I mean, she was, I mean, she, she really went through like the makeup artists and the hair and everything else. But what's the spiritual application of that? How much should we be ready? Because when he's there, you're not thinking about, man, man, there are so, there are so many drugs I could have done. Man, I should have really stuffed in more drugs. You know, there's so much more adultery I could have done. I could, I could have, should have hooked up. You're not thinking that. You're thinking about, I should have prepared for this day. There's no other day that matters than this day, right? Like your wedding. This is important. Let's go to First Thessalonians. So you see the dramaticness of the thief coming in the night. We're talking the elements melt. The whole world goes to a meltdown. That's, that's very stark, very startling. Go to First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Is that New Testament? Yeah, New Testament. <laughs> yeah, and Thessalonians, what was interesting about the why the Thessalonians book was written is there's not a book to Berea. To the church of berea do you know why because why is that zach you remember why they read their bibles, they read their bibles. do you know why these these letters are written it's for people that screwed up they messed up every letter here isn't for the super righteous it's for people that really blew it then so he had to write a letter the letter to the thessalonians were they didn't read their bibles so he says well because you didn't read your bibles you know I'm, you're going to have to be schooled. But the Bereans, when Paul spoke, they went to the Bibles to see what Paul was saying was true. And they go, it checks out. So every time you see a letter, don't think it's to holy, righteous people. It's to kind of the knuckleheads that were like, I ain't going to read that Bible. And it's like, all right, now we have a bunch of problems. So he's there writing letters. Every letter is a problem letter. Every letter is addressing problems. Because... They weren't really making themselves ready. And it's a here, a little there, a little line upon line, precept upon precept thing. Guys, we've got to go back to the basics. Every letter is that from Paul. Does that make sense? First Thessalonians chapter five, verses one, just read on down. And uh, we'll even go chapter four a little bit later where we talk about Noah's flood. But God likens his return as the flood. Believe me, that wasn't a big secret. <laughs> You know, that was very dramatic, very sudden. Go ahead. Who wants to start with verse one? But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, and they were pains upon its pregnancy. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, Stop right there. Any thoughts? Be ready. Yeah, be ready, huh? <laughs> because sudden, they're going to say, what is going to be the, the language? Peace and safety. Hey, don't sweat it. So the, what? Lukewarm. Yeah. Well, they like everything homogenized. Everything placid. Everything conformed, everything, you know, kind of in this, let nothing be changed. You know, we want everything in this certain kind of, you know, st static kind of way. 
Yeah, well, we'll chillax because Laodicea, when we get into Laodicean church, was a health resort. That's why they had the eye salve and then they made these black kind of garments and they, it's all this picture. They weren't ready. God spewed them out of his mouth. And Sardis is the last stop before you get, and this is important to understand in this, in this study. Why is Sardis so important? It happens to be the, before we get to the last two churches, the last two churches are two camps that split into two distinct groups. And you're going to see that one is doing everything right. And the other is doing everything wrong. Both are, uh, 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 are there at the coming of Christ. You'll see it in the language. The church of Philadelphia, you've been to Philadelphia. Yeah. What does Philadelphia mean? The city brotherly of love. brotherly love. So what is going to characterize the people of God at the end of time? Their love for one another. It says that the world may know that you that we are one. If you're one with me, be one with one another, right? This is this is going to characterize. There's going to be an incredible amount of love for God and for one another at the end of time. No doubt about it. Because that is going to characterize the kingdom of God. If you're going to be on the streets of gold, are you going to be having a bunch of gossip and petty issues between everybody? Or are you just going to love on them? Right? God's kingdom is that kingdom. And I'm, I kid you not, we're to be working out in our fellowship a real streets of gold mentality. Right? Yeah, like we're already there. Yeah, exactly. We're supposed to be walking here like we are there. And the world is supposed to see a little slice of what? The New Jerusalem in our fellowship. You got to practice. Practice. And you have to deal with problem after problem and situation after situation until you work those things out. Because the one thing you have to learn about Christ is he knew what to do with a problem. We are not good with our problems. So what do we do when we try to manage a problem? We tend to make them worse, right? Don't we? Create other, create other problems. Yeah, even in relationships, even amongst friends, what do we do? How do we react to, give me a situation, to somebody talking behind your back? Pull up. Pull oh, you start rolling your neck and saying, I'm going to put you on blast and da-da-da or some other oh thing, God. right? I, I'm at the point where... Yeah, what, but what do you do? What, what, what is the way that we make it worse, though? Saying By going back. off. Saying something. By, by spreading rumors about them, by whatever else. And that's a way to combat it in our mind, going, oh, this is the way to fix it. But it's almost like, you know, we the way we fix things, we make it worse. Have you ever tried fixing something and only got worse? I, I got a great story for that. I remember my grandmother had gophers. And so I'm telling my grandma, I'm going to kill this gopher, right? So I heard about, you know, that you could like drown them, right? You put a hose inside the thing. Well, these gophers had this elaborate gopher thing in her front yard. I flooded out her whole front yard that I'm following with my arm thinking, no, I'm just going to get this. And all the dirt was kind of like shoveling up from my arm. Her whole front yard was my arm following the gopher trail. I destroyed her whole front lawn. It was nothing but you could see all the habit trail of gophers with me. Just I tore up. It was it looked fine. It was just holes with the gophers. But in fixing the gopher problem, I just totally destroyed this giant, not a little front lawn, like this big, big around the corner, around this all this giant front lawn. Sounds like Caddyshack. Yeah, I would all. It was like that. It was all night long. I was running that hose. Yeah, you must have been very bored. Well, and I was well, I was obsessed. I was going to fix this. I am done with these gophers. And what did I do? I completely destroyed her whole front yard. Just trying to deal with the gopher problem. You can make that application to how we deal with problems in the church, how we deal with problems in our families, how we deal with problems in our life, at the job. How many people try to handle the situation their job and they only made it worse? I can so tell you, you I got so many time. stories you wouldn't believe it. And so God is the king of dealing with problems. And a lot of times we don't understand why he lets some things go. We don't understand why he confronts some things. We don't understand why he's merciful here, why he's confrontive and non-tolerant here. But he's the king of fixing problems. And it's not like he lacks any self-sacrifice. We have saw that at Calvary. We understand he obviously doesn't have that problem. So God is trying to tell us, learn how to solve problems. Do you know what leadership is? Solving problems. Not sitting there with your crown on making people lick your boots. That is not leadership. 
It is not your time to be worshipped. You're just really good at fixing stuff, right? Is that real leadership? I'd follow somebody that's a great fixer of problems. Taking control. And fixing it. A leader fixes problems. And so this is what we have to even do amongst the body of Christ. If you want to love one another, we're going to be given a bunch of problems. We're going to see a bunch of problems. We're going to have to manage a bunch of problems. We're going to have to be in the area of love, forgiveness, confrontation. You're going to have to cry with them. You're going to have to laugh with them sometime. You're going to have to roll up your sleeves and get in their life. At some point, you're going to have to put limits and, and say, hey, you know, Paul had to deliver a couple guys to Satan and to let Satan beat them up for a while. Then they're going to come back in and learn their lesson. There's all kinds of tools in your tool chest. It's not just a one size fits all when you're de dealing with people. You need all the tools. But we as the body of Christ should not make the problem worse. I've been to church after church, fellowship after fellowship of in trying to fix problems. They went by the flesh. They put a spiritual label upon it. And they made it a thousand times worse. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but I have with my own naked eyeballs over and over and over again. So God says that my people We'll learn how to love one another. And loving one another is not just a sentimental thing. Oh, brother, I'm going to, you know, never confront you. But it's also not endlessly confronting. Like, you know, there is this beautiful apothecary of blend. And we have to ask God for wisdom. Does that make sense? So let's continue on reading in our text. Verse 9. Oh, oh, P.S. on verse 8, it says, let us who are of the day be sober, putting on what? The breastplate of faith and love for helmet, the hope of salvation, right? Remember the hope of salvation? We talked about this in the uh, in the study, the, 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 the uh, idea of the uh, Christ in the hope of glory. So what is this suit of armor talking about? It's talking about the high priest. What he was wearing was a breastplate. The hat he was wearing is called a helmet. That the, This hope that you have, you guys, is because Jesus Christ is fighting for you up in heaven. There's a He's advocating for you. Do you know that a lawyer is fighting for you? That's what a lawyer does. You hire an advocate. What does he do? He fights in your behalf. And so Christ is saying, listen, I'm fighting for you. So a lot of times when God says, when you're dealing with a sinner, it's like a brand plucked from the fire. Man, it even says that hating the garment that stains, but plucking them from the fire in the book of Jude. Do you know what that means? Sometimes it's a very, very dramatic work. Bless you. Do you know, like for me, I used to have to be, because I did counseling, I did mental health, I did pastoring, I did all kinds of stuff, you guys. I'm trying to tell you, who was the one having to do the dirty work all the time of confrontation? Everyone else loves being the good guy. But it had to be me getting in there with all the stuff, all the muck and gook and sewage and all the kind of sludge of human darkness. They're sending me in so I can have to deal with all that stuff. And then everyone else likes the whole good guy position. Have you ever been there? Jerry, you ever been there? Oh, so you know what I'm talking about. Every day. And it's no joke. Yeah, you have to be there in the human muck and you're going to have to be there to be as a redemptive healing uh, uh, element to the whole thing. And I'm telling you, the people that have advice that sit on the outside give you these little trite things of what to say. Oh, just be kind and loving and this, this, this. Of course. But man, you, there's also confrontation. There's also hard truth. I have wept with people. I've laughed with people. I have confronted and been their temporary enemy. I've been their best friend, all in the same person. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I come out with the with, with you know sulfur steaming off me and all the battle wounds, and we're arm in arm walking out of there. And everyone else is just going, "Wow, I'm so glad you dealt with that, Dave." <laughs> but I can talk about these nice little platitudes. Well, very nice of you to do, but I'm in there in the hell zone, and I'm get. This is what it's like to really work with people. Roll up your sleeves and get in there, right? The body of Christ doesn't want to do that. Everyone wants to look all nice and primped and beautiful and perfect and never deal with the muck and guck of humanity. Jesus Christ rolled up his sleeves and dealt with the muck and guck. What, are you better than him? No, we're not. No, we're not. Get into the muck and guck. We're not better than one another. In relative speaking, relative to Christ, we can compare ourselves. But again, I go back to my illustration. It's one lizard comparing himself to the other lizard. I lick my eye with 
my uh, I left my left eye with my tongue. I lick my right eye. Our our lizard tribe is better. Well, I got the purple thing. I got the green thing. It's ridiculous. We're comparing ourselves, you know, in you know, in the worst possible measuring rod. Yeah, reality is, guys, we're all sinners, and we're all east of Eden, and we all have to learn how to love each other outside of posing, outside of posturing. Outside of the parade, outside of this showing your little costume show, enough. The world has seen enough of it. Real people that really love know how to deal with real problems. And guess what? Even if you don't know how to deal with them, you're jumping in and you're asking God for help. Can I give you an interesting illustration? It's actually because I like reading history in regard to some of these things and and I try to keep it far from personal illustrations sometimes because, you know, I don't know friends sometimes watch or whatever. But I'll tell you an ancient story of a Persian prince. And, uh, yeah, this is going to be, you're going to like this story because the Persian king had this whole armada of ships. And so the king would be in the front ship and his son would be in the very back ship. And so they were sailing across, I think, the Aegean I, I Sea or something like that. And they were sailing across and the armada was going and the son was in the back ship and the father was in the front ship. And they had all the royal kind of flagship stuff and everything else. In the son's ship, a sailor who was crawling up to the sails falls off and falls overboard. And he's drowning, this young sailor. And the, the, the young prince is looking to the captain of the ship saying, aren't you going to do anything? He's drowning. And so the captain says, the king's armada turns around for no man. And so the prince took off his robes, who couldn't swim himself, and jumps in, says, before he jumps in, says, but for the king's son, it will turn around. And they turn that whole armada around to save him. That sounds like a bitch. That's Christ. Does this make sense? Yeah. Even if you don't know, your sympathy should draw you in and God will help you. Right? Mm -hmm. That's how you learn. I don't want to hear how disqualified we are all the time. I'm sick of hearing it. Jump in. God will help you. And I don't know, but I'm here to help. I don't know what I can do. I, first thing I could do is just say, all right, I'm here. Let's see what we can do. I'll make some phone calls. We'll do something, man. Right now, you just need me to be here right now, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. That's love. That's love. All right, let's go on. Yes. All right, verse 9, you're right. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, should be together with us. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. <clears throat> we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonishing, and admonishing, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace amongst yourselves. Isn't that interesting? This is all Thief of the Night stuff, but all the stuff we're talking about is making sense in this, isn't it? Go ahead. Now we exhort you, brethren. Warn those who are utterly comfort and faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. Be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every word of evil, every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do. Stop right there, okay? He's going to help you. This is a big, tall order to say, hey, listen, guys, be this way. Be this way. But he says, I am faithful to do it. I'm going to help you through this. Because you need training. You need to do some circles in helping people. The worst thing, the worst sentence I got, because I was waiting for my big mission call when I was in Sweden, 
and they're all passing out these exotic calls. And I got gypped. I got sent back to San Jose, the armpit of the world. <clears throat> oh, you got an audio thing on that? It's okay. And so, you know, I really thought I got gypped. I thought I got double gypped when I'm in the hot tub in San Jose on Winchester Boulevard. This lady jumps in and she's talking about working with adolescents. The one promise, one thing I said to God is I never want to revisit my adolescence. It was hell on earth. For me, it was. Maybe it was a party for you. It was hell for me personally. And uh, I don't want to deal with mental health because I have a crazy family. Everyone's crazy in my family. I just, I joined the Navy to get away from the craziness of adolescence and crazy uh, family. Sure enough, God is saying you're going into mental health and you'll be dealing with teenagers like, God, no. Like, what did I do to offend you? That's right, Dave. And I don't know how long you're going to be there for. In fact, I'm going to, I got started off as a van driver. So I'm picking up kids that are getting kicked out of school or whatever. Try driving a van in a level 14 group home in California. Trust me. It's <laughs> it's just craziness, right? Take them to the mall. Uh, yeah, I don't want to get into all this story. I got a million crazy stories. But you're pulling over. I call it therapy on wheels. I'm pulling over the side of the road. All right, that's it. We're okay. Stop. Put your seatbelt on. This is you two. Right? This them not getting in the van. You know, endless. You know, how many trips do I have to take the juvenile hall in that van to say. You either you know get the police out or i mean i cannot tell you the endless amount of ridiculousness but i wrestle with these kids and i loved them and i talked with them and i shared with them and i ate endless amount of burritos and jamba juice with them and i had to do whatever and i confronted and i imparted and i went in there not glorious as a van driver from van driver became a child care worker as a child care worker you know i've already been there i've already done all this stuff in life you know, I've already studied all the psychology. I mean, he started me low. I might as well have been emptying the trash. And then I will go from child care worker to other stories. I became the supervisor, et cetera, like this. And I'm telling you that I thought God was punishing me. He just wasn't into me. Dave, I want everyone else in ministry. Everyone else is going to be a pastor. Everyone else is going to have exotic travels. Everyone else is going to have this wonderful experience. They're all going to have these wonderful, look at me, chicken Fiji serving the Lord <laughs> with my pineapple drink. Look, I'm snorkeling for Jesus. You notice I'm not smiling? <laughs> because it was horrible. I thought he was benching me again. What? Circle, circle, circles, more circles, you know, you confrontation circles. Was that? You lived it. Yeah. So yeah. And, and to really, and, and what's interesting is I cannot tell you how many times I had to run the bathroom for prayer. I had to pray all the time. Every time they're, so they start sending me for all the crises. There's a fight between the kids. The kids trying to hang themselves in the tree on and on and on. David, 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 wait a minute. I'm the little man, the totem pole. You're the one with the masters. You're the one with the PhD. You're the one that, you know, has been doing this for 15 years. Why are you calling me? But God was giving me wisdom. God was giving me those skill sets. I was endlessly praying endlessly. Uh, when I was working the night shift, the knock shift, the overnight shift, I'm reading everyone's history. I'm the only counselor there that would read all 30 histories of all the kids. And I knew all their backgrounds. So then when they put me on day shift, I knew everyone's history. Nobody knew their history. No one had time. You're just doing progress notes, right? You're just, you know, always kind of on the go. And hey, guys, time to eat. Hey, listen, don't throw mashed potatoes on the ceiling. Da, da, da. You know, you're just endlessly, you know, in this kind of mode, power struggles, fighting, where I would be like, you know, go into situation. This is not like your stepdad who used to make you sleep outside where you had to sleep in the field with that pea-stained blanket protecting your brothers in the middle of the night. How do you know about that? This is not that situation. You're safe here. How do you know about that? God was giving me these things. And then all of a sudden, I was the person, I did more 5150s than any of the counselors. I made more contracts with any of the, any of the kids. I had more I love views from the kids. I had more like, I want David there at my graduation sitting next to me. I jumped out of I jumped out of airplanes with kids as an illustration of the show that I wanted to kill them at 14,000 feet. No parachute for you. 
Okay. I have the power. That's right. Oh, did I say? <laughs> I didn't put pear. What? That's all of your lunch stuff coming out of your. No. <laughs> that's a Capri Sun. That's not a parachute. <laughs> that's right. That's goldfish crackers. That's not a parachute. Right. And so what it is, is that, what did I really have to learn? That love goes there, right? Unless you know how to go, unless you're willing to go there, you know nothing about love. Because I knew this much, and I hate to admit this, I don't want to admit it, but I'm going to, is when I was in Sweden and I'm waiting for my big exotic thing where everyone's saying, David, whoo, God, the Holy Spirit is on this young man, David. I was 25 at the time. Man, God's got this special call for you. He's going to send you to the most exotic. And I was telling my friend, uh, Rick, we we're walking around, and he made a comment, and I'll never forget it. We're walking through the fields. They had the, the, you know, these super huge clover fields when I was up in Sweden. We're walking through these clover fields forever. And he's saying, you know, David, he was a pastor in, in Glendale, California for 16 years. And I remember we're walking and he's all saying, Dave, you know, I don't really have a problem loving people. You know, I really have a problem being loved. And I remember he was walking and I was, I literally couldn't move. That was me. I had a real hard time receiving love to really letting it in. You know what I mean? I always had the walls, I always had the filter. And then I was listening to a tape because I was frustrated because I was the only person that didn't get cool orders. So I was working in the bakery uh, uh, at the mission site. A flower all over me. I listened to a tape and the guy was preaching a sermon on the Song of Moses. And the Song of Moses says, how can you sing the Song of Moses in the book of Revelation, the Song of Moses and the Lamb, if you didn't go through the experience of Moses where God says, I'll blot their name out and I'll give you a whole new people. Moses says, blot my name out and spare them. And God says, now you're getting it. So the speaker on that tape says, do you have that kind of love for God's people? They're screwing up. They're fumbling the ball at 50 feet in the air. They're ruining everything. God says, all right, I'll wipe them out and I'll give you a group of good folks. And Moses says, no, 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 blot my name out. Keep them. Now you're a shepherd. And I realized at that point, I don't know how to be loved and I don't know how to love. And I thought I, I thought I did because I was a giving person. I was the, the one providing for my brothers all the time. I was the one running around helping people. I was search and rescue in the Navy. I do, you know, I'm the natural counselor. I thought I was Mr. Love. God says, we've got to start you back from here, a little there, a little line upon line. We're going to take you back to the basics. I'm sending you back to San Jose. You're going to revisit adolescence. You're going to revisit mental health. You're going to be in the two words you hate the most in the whole planet. No, that's right. San Jose. No, you mean Hades? Hell? The Guadalupe River is really sticks. You know, he sent me there. Year after year after year after year after year after year after year. I would work adult mental health and they'd shoot me right back to adolescence. I'm like a freak. I'm moving on to adult mental health. Back to adolescence. No! For me, that was the worst. But God had given me the most uh, impact with the adolescence. And then they're making me a youth pastor. When do I escape the youth? Youth was the worst time of my life, but always around the youth, always around the youth. And do you know what? This is, this is how God's teaching me how to love. God's healing my own life by revisiting, revisiting things that I thought I was free from. But this time we're going to have victory. This time we're going to have results. This time we're going to have transformation. Does that make sense? That's not in vain. And we, a lot of times, and this is the whole point of the thief of the night. A lot of times we think the answer is to escape things. But God says, because that's why you get this false doctrine of thief in the night stuff. We just want to escape. Oh, I don't want to be in a time of trouble. I don't want to go through testing. I don't want to go through great tribulation in my life. So the number one country in the world for pain medication is where? Here in the United States. Yeah. This is the center of the world for escapism. Disneyland, Disney World, Netflix, you name it. We are the escapist capital of the world. 
We lead the world. We show the world how to escape. We have movies. We have Hollywood. We're the ones telling the world, this is how you pretend. This is how you escape. This is how you learn how to run. We run from everything. So our theology reflects it. I don't want to have to go through hard times. In ancient times, going through hard times was a great school, a great university, a great teaching institute, the school of hard knocks. knocks. That's your teacher, right? Experience well-guided is your teacher. I know people that have nothing but experience, but are as dumb as a sack of hammers. They learned nothing from their experiences. But God is trying to knock on, our, knock on this noggin and say, there's lessons to be learned here. It's not just not repeating these things. There's even deeper lessons than the not repeating this. What are you supposed to get out of this? What are you going to learn about God? What are you going to learn about God? We have a very low tolerance of certain things that God has suffered long in regard to. And I'm talking about low tolerance for things we see in other people. That's true about us. How many people do you know, including myself, any of us, that they don't like the thing about themselves and somebody else? And everyone will say, the reason you don't like so-and-so because they're a lot like you. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Well, that's true. There is a lot of things I can tolerate. But when I see certain things and some people, I'm going, God, I don't know if I could do it that one. People say, dude, hey, that's kind of like how you are. Like, don't even saddle me with that, bro. But believe it or not, when King David was going through all the hell of Saul, Everyone saw King David as this great guy, and Saul was a psychopath throwing spears at him. He was nuts, right? And what was the deal? Why did God let David, who anointed him to be king, why did God allow David to go through what he went through for all those years? Shana. Because there was a Saul inside of David. David was the true king of Israel. Saul was the stand-in until David was ready. Saul was used to ready David to be a king. So that's why David felt bad every time that he, you know, went in and he cut the robe of Saul and did a few little snipey things. Remember, Saul went into the cave to go to the bathroom. You guys know about that story? Yeah, he went into a cave to, to relieve himself to go number two. David snuck in and cut off with his knife a piece of the hem of his garment. Saul takes off and David comes out there saying, I could have killed you. Dude, I had the hem of your garment. And then David felt sick about going, what am I doing? This is the Lord's anointed. What was anointed? Not just Saul, but what Saul was to David. An endless, endless test of David to, to show things about David that would never be seen because everyone loved David. Everyone loved Raymond, right? He's just a lovable guy. So you being loved and fawned over and told how wonderful you are, do you really get to be in touch with that dark side of you very often? No. You're too busy thinking about yourself. Everyone loves me. That's great, too. Are you really doing much reflection? You are never, never, never more introspective than when you're under great what? Testing. You get to find out who you really are. And guess what? The things we see, a lot of times we're not very, we're not very happy with what we see. Well, I think. Why did, why did most people try to kill Christ? Because he was truthful. Yeah. People don't want to hear Christ. And they saw themselves. They saw how unreasonable they are, how intolerant they are, how projecting they are. Everything that was true about them, they projected on Christ. You're a liar. You're a deceiver. You're an imposter. No, you're the imposter. You're the fake. You're the hypocrite. You're the play actor here. And they projected all of this on Christ. Isn't that what the narcissist does to the codependent or whoever they can victimize? Don't they just project away? They keep blaming you for what they're, what's true about them. That is a false atonement. Atonement is you're lifting the burden off you and you're putting on somebody else. And so we falsely try to alleviate any accountability by now saying, no, you're the problem. And do you think churches don't do that and fellowships don't do that? Oh, yes, they do. You could be just as toxic as a church and never get identified because you know how to play with spiritual language. That's why I had you read in 1 Thessalonians 5, says, despise not prophecy. Do you know why? Why, Zach? What's the spirit of prophecy? It's the testimony of Jesus. Yeah, that's a nice quick answer. That was good. Break it down, bro. <laughs> now, I don't want the slicky answer. It's 
Um, what did we talk about last night? Yeah, it's it's truth. It's going to be a revelation of who God is, a revelation of your character. There's going to be a place where you enter in with God where there's no shadow of turning, where you're going to have to stand naked. Yeah. And you're going to realize things about yourself that you don't know. You're going to know that you don't know yourself, and then you're going to be told those things. When you have the Holy Spirit in the midst of a group and it's really the Holy Spirit, you can't fake it. You're not supposed to. We shouldn't have an environment where we're sitting around here where people are kind of playing their games, where they're here to be as a predator. They're here to find weak people to exploit. We don't need that. And when you have the Holy Spirit, that gets found out. When you don't have the Holy Spirit, you have a different spirit, you have incredible spiritual abuse, abuse take place. Oh, yeah, me too money or or to make you feel bad about confronting a pastor that's wrong about whatever flirting with some girls in the congregation when he's married i've had to deal with that i've confronted pastor friends and they come off like the majesty of satan now comes out of them but they still have all the spiritual reason you understand my wife doesn't meet my needs god called this other woman she's the wife that i should have right right, right. if i could just get rid of this wife and have her we're gonna have this amazing ministry yeah it's called straight up adultery and I've seen people spiritualize this stuff. And you think God is fooled by it? this weird word game we play with his words? Well, didn't David try to fool it? Right. Did it work? Nathan, <laughs> Nathan the prophet went up to him and says, hey, Dave, I got a story to tell you. Right? And did the old flipper flip on him. And Dave was like, Bang, you're talking about me, right? Uh, yeah, I think we're talking about you, Dave. This is important. All right, guys, let's go to our next text is this helpful thief in the night let's be careful guys that we ourselves are not in this escapist i just want to live in obscurity and i don't want god to expose if you want the holy spirit in your life he's preparing you to meet the king who is called the light of the world you're not going to run and hide from him so why do it now let's live openly before a loving merciful god does that make sense luke chapter 12 verse 35 yeah because you know in the end, you're going to be at a hard moy it gets. You're going to be standing at a mountain and everything's going to be exposed. Everybody's going to be watching. They're going to be looking when your whole life is being played. Like, no, no, don't play that portion. Sorry, it's not redacted. No. All right, let's go through your, uh, what's that, your IP addresses? <laughs> let's start going through your internet searches. No, God, please. No. Never mind. Never. Okay, burn me. Okay, kill me. I'm cool. 35. Luke 12, 35. Thank you so much, sweetie. Bye. We're going to look at this thief in the night idea, and we're going to look at this wedding picture that's here. But let's look at Luke chapter 12, verse 35 to verse 40. He dressed, sent his servants, and he to a man's wedding. Like servants waiting for the master return from our wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress themselves to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come an hour when you do not expect it. You see the whole thief picture here? Mm -hmm. You should be ready because, you know what? You should be preparing yourself for a very dramatic, very plunderous, very stark, shocking day. And you should be ready for that event. And so he goes into this kind of keep your lamps burning. Uh, there's a wedding picture here. Uh, the thief picture. It's all about being ready and anticipating a big event. That's all it's really talking about. And you should know what hour. You should sense that this is the time. You guys, I am here to tell you that this is the time to be preparing yourself. I don't think it's any accident that we're all meeting here. Listen, I lived in Salinas. I've lived in Fresno. How come we didn't meet each other there? Well, we did here. Is that interesting? Because I think we were all looking for the same thing. And God is going to find a way to draw you. If you really, in your heart of hearts, somewhere inside of you really does love truth and his voice is whispering in your head somewhere, 
and that's where you want to go, you're going to find yourself around these truths. Okay? Go to Matthew 24, verses 42 to 44. Thank you, sweetheart. Matthew 24, 42 to 44. Do you want to, I also got some reading glasses. Do you want some? Does that help a little bit? I can see close with one eye. All right, baby. I, I have to, I'm still waiting for the tabs. For the, we got, I got you that big old giant one. Those, those, uh, is that great? I'm wow. For the tabs. Let's get those so tabs, can, man. Yeah. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you, also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect it. You're not watching. The world's, yeah, that's perfect right there. exactly from like what you just read. Yeah, exactly. And it's giving you that little, little insight. It's like your house, the idea of a plunder is to break up the house. And you're going to see here when Christ, we're going to go back to Matthew 24 here in a sec. But Christ was saying, I'm the stronger man binding up the strong man of the household. And I'm going to plunder his house. In other words, you know, when thieves come in, they put zip ties on you or they tie you up. Jesus uses that illustration of himself. I'm here to tie up the strong guy in the house so I could plunder your, his house. It is a stark, startling, shocking thing for God to refer to himself as a thief. Because thieves were always, of course, bad, right? Christ was, if you really want to shame Christ and associate him with negative people, put him between two thieves upon a cross and believe it or not, the PR alone is going to be bad for him. Nobody in the Jewish culture thought these were cool. But there is one context, and that is a great uh, uh, swashbuckling plunderer. Okay, they could get into that for some reason. And God's saying, yeah, but in the thief business, you have to tie up the strong man. And what I'm doing it, through my gospel is I'm tying up the strong man through the gospel. And how is that? How does Christ diminish the power of satan by preaching this gospel he literally is trying to help you to see that he does not have power over you he does not have dominion over you i'm coming in there to plunder his house one day i'm taking you to my house and no one will ever snatch you away that's the language he uses but go to revelation 1 verse 7 first because i want you to see when he shows up it's there's nothing secret about it it's shocking and startling it is certainly sudden and disturbing, but it's not secret. Revelation 1 7, what does it say? Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Wow. Is this is this super clear? Don't let anyone tell you of these bizarre stories of secret this, secret that, secret the other thing. Get out of the whole Babylon is secret. Secret societies and secret handshakes and secret. Get out of the secret thing. Joe Biden licking his ice cream. It's it's a little sign to the pedophiles out there. It is, whether you know it or not. So we don't need the little winks and the secrets and the this and that. Do you know what God says? And I'm not going to put it in this study, but he says that, that there's not a lot of things that God says he hates. He says he does hate certain things. But do you know what he really hates? It says in Proverbs 6. The winking, the nodding, the secret little signaling. He hates it. He hates the he hates secrets. He comes to reveal that which is secret is being revealed. Anything hidden, yeah, the lights are turned on. He hates secrets. Do you want to know how to have power over over somebody? Make them keep secrets. That's what my ex-wife did to my son. Hey, we're gonna go and do this. Keep it a secret from your dad. We're going to go and do this. Keep it a secret from your dad. We're going to go and do the other thing and do that. But make sure you don't tell your dad. And that's weird how keeping somebody secrets gives them power over you. Do you know anything? You know about this, right? You know about this in, in child abuse. You want the kid to be under the power of their abuser? No. That abuser makes them keep secrets. This will be our secret. 
And they groom them. That's and then they'll use it in the future and be like, that's and they, you, they, the grooming is tiny little secrets. I stole this little thing. Don't tell anyone. That's how they compromise their dog. Too. Yeah. This is this weird confiding, and that you are kind of in a secret mode. Don't worry. God is into open. Worship me openly. Daniel, don't pray in secret. Pray openly. Proclaim me on the rooftops. Be open. This little creepy secret thing is, it is creepy. God's not a creep. All right, Matthew 24, verse 27. I mean, 26. Back to Matthew 24. Is this helpful? Yes. So don't be afraid when God exposes even things in your life. Even the book of John, chapter 3, says, do you know why people don't come to the light? You, you know what it says? Because we know of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life, but keep reading. People stop there and they go, is that great? And then they put it on their jersey and they say, Tim Tebow, or at the bottom of their in and out cup. But it's more than that. It's more than a slogan. Keep reading. He talks about, I'm the light of the world. And do you know why people don't come to the light? Because they don't want their secrets exposed. Because of shame. What does Satan use more than anything else to put you in bondage? Shame. Secrets and shame. Secrets and shame. Secrets and shame. Secrets and shame. And then so God says, bring your naked shame to me and I will cleanse you and cover you and heal you and you could be healed again. That is the essence of counseling. Did you know that? The essence of counsel, you know, the word therapy in the Greek, therapos, is the word heal. In When you see Jesus heal, Jesus heal, look at the word, it's therapos. Why is it therapos? What does the word therapos mean? Therapos. It's fire, right? It means fire. It's a servant that wakes up at three o'clock in the morning and gets the fire started to warm up the house so everyone can wake up and move about before the sun comes. It's somebody who lights a fire before the sun comes. That's what therapy is. I remember when I was uh, in survival school and the big we'd be freezing out in these desert mountains and we're all hugged like a bunch of puppies laying on top of each other. These are all special forces people acting like a bunch of puppies and no one wants to go out and build a fire at 3.30 in the morning. I'm not going out, you go out. Special forces, wow. I thought they're the best of the best. I, Mr. Cold Redhead, who's only 146 pounds, freezing more than anyone else. Believe me, if you're a redhead, you're more sensitive to cold, whether you know it or not. And I would go out and I would start the fire. I would get it going. All of a sudden, these big, tough special forces guys are coming. Hey, thanks, Dave. I appreciate that, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was the therapist in me. Like me, man. You can't even uh, count. Uh-huh. Going out there in the morning. Well, I'm out there starting a fire, right? That's right. And it's snow on the ground. I'm barefooted, put yeah. my underwear on, starting a fire. We don't need the visual mic. Just yeah. tell the story, man. You know, the boxers, you know, the whatever. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fire, then they all start coming out. Of the all fire. of a sudden, yeah, all of a sudden, you're, 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 you're the cool guy. Yeah. Well, guess what? You know, this is the point of therapy is to start a fire while they're in the night. Warmth and, and light and heat in the nighttime so they can meet the noonday sun. Does this make any sense? You guys, this is what we do. This is what it means to love one another. Let's go back to our text. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, and let's start at verse 26 to 31. Go ahead, Paige. So they will have told you, there he is out in the wilderness. Do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is evil, even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will far from, fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples on the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming out of the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Dramatic, isn't it? Powerful. 
be careful the person that says the secret chamber or this little nuance you know get away from all that when christ comes it is intensely dramatic you guys be prepared this is the whole key i could get into more details about this very fascinating so go to now the verse 37 of matthew 24 and just read on down from 37 to 41. Start with verse 37. Rachel, Rachel, do you want to or no? I don't care either way. Okay, go ahead, Rachel. But as the day of Noah, as the day of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. <clears throat> and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Stop right there. So it was sudden. Now, what's interesting, we're going to get into Luke chapter 17, just prepared to turn there, is a lot of people will teach the opposite of what the Bible is teaching. Th those that are taken, those that are left, a lot of people say, well, taken, they're taken to heaven. And the others left, they're left down here to live in tribulation. The same story is being told, the same sermon recorded by Luke, and the question of the disciples are, where are they taken? And he says, to where the bodies are, where all the birds and the vultures are eating them. Because they're wondering, because the, it's the flood story. And you're going to see when we get into a little bit of Genesis, we're going to kind of, we're in the last lap of our study here. But the taken are those that are going to be taken by the flood, taken by the wrath of God, taken away. The remaining those who remain at the coming of Christ are going to see in the book back to Thessalonians, those who are alive and remain are going to be the ones that God brings to heaven with him. It's remaining. A lot of times we, we got this being taken away by the world, taken away by the things of this world, taken away by the flood, taken away is a bad thing. You're taken to your destruction. It's, it's a picture of being bound and cast into prison and you're going to be judged and, and destroyed you're being taken you know it's like the police coming to your door and arresting you like the eighty-seven thousand irs agents that are able to carry guns and they're going to be taking you away because of your ppp loan so get ready being taken is the picture here of the destruction of the wicked and it's remaining so remain in faith remain standing in christ remain trusting remain your steadfastness in your fellowship with him and with one another remaining is everything stick in there does that make sense go to luke chapter 17 verse 24. <clears throat> all right who would like to do some reading zach you want to read start with verse 24. For as, the, for as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Same will happen to you, by the way. Go ahead. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day... He who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men in See one the bed. night theft coming here? Go ahead. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. 
And they answered and said to him, where, Lord? Because they already know the remaining. They're in the field, at the mill, in the bed. So we know where the remaining are. So where are they taken, Lord? And he's going to tell them. So he said to them, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Yeah, that's a horrible thing. So God is, his whole thing is get ready, stand, remain, your bridegroom's coming. That is the massive theme of scripture. If you miss that, you're missing the whole purpose of what we're doing in this last generation. You check out this whole remaining thing. Again, go to Genesis chapter 7, verse 23. Let's go to the flood and just read one verse from the flood story. Is it about remaining or is it about being taken? A lot of people keep saying, well, Kirk Cameron had this whole series called, uh, was it left or behind or something like that? I don't want to remain. I don't want to be, I want to be taken. You don't want to be taken. You want to remain. Yeah, verse 23, Genesis 7, 23. Remaining is everything. Go ahead. Yeah, and some translations say what? Remained, right? Remained. First Thessalonians chapter, yeah, remained. Remaining is everything. Hang in there. Persevere. Stay in Christ. Remaining. Like, like a marriage or like, like, let's say, working through something. Just hang in there for it. Let the process take place. A lot of people will punch out of many circumstances, and that circumstance was really there to, to do something for you. The time of trouble is really preparing God's people to, to get ready for him because it's going to just get us away from all the idolatry and the things we cling on into this world. It's very easy to hold on to these very superficial things in our life. My career, my reputation, my money, my whatever. And we hold on to certain crutches. In the end, he's going to say, well, are you able to just hold on to me? Remain in me. And guess what? Everything else will be taken away. In the end, it says you can't even buy or sell. We will get there in scripture. The Bible is guaranteeing you there comes a point where you can't even participate in the economy. Don't have any fantasies about it. And those that Compromise them, sit their faith to do that, says they receive the mark of the beast. In other words, you are going to be a part of the system. And you're going to say, if I have to forsake Christ to do that, I will. And Christ says, you're holding on. It's like the days of 70 AD. If you look at the money system back at the time of Christ, and they were doing this big building project, they were building and at, they're marrying and giving and marrying. They're eating and drinking. They kill Christ because they're saying, we don't want to deal with this man. You know how long it was? It was another 30-something years where these people are holding on to their money, holding on to their political position, Pontius Pilate, all of them. Do you know what ended up happening? Jerusalem was destroyed by the Roman armies. And do you know what their money meant at that point? It was Confederate money, man. It was rolling around the streets. It meant nothing. There was zero value to that Jewish money. And they thought it was important to hold on to their position, all this stuff. They were a bunch of slaves and prisoners being sent off to Rome or wherever they were going to or be slaughtered. I, I, I sent it on my Facebook page and I, I'll send it to you guys. This 30 something minute documentary or something like that on 70 AD and they showed all the, stuff, the process of what happened. It's one of the most horrific things I've ever seen. Even Rome says nothing was more bloody. Carthage, the plundering of Carthage and 70 AD with the Jews was the two most horrific battles. Like where the bloodshed was insane. A million people murdered, slaughtered over this whole thing. It was horrific. And they said that that's like one of the most horrific parts of the memories of Rome was what happened in 70 AD where people were cannibalizing off one another and, and the battles that were fought and the horrible <clears throat> atrocities for what they're holding on to something that God says is going to go. We're holding on to stuff that God says is going to go. The Bible's saying that, not David. Who cares what David says? I got opinions. They mean nothing. Yeah. So this is important to get, get a hold of you guys. Go ahead. Uh, where are we at? Yeah. Let's go to first Thessalonians chapter four. Let's look at remaining. We'll kind of be uh, rounding the corner because what I'm also going to try to show you is, how Christ is the, there's so much more to the study. I wish I could do more. We're only going to go through about half of this study, believe it or not. Chapter four, verse 13. 
Let's look at the remaining. Start with verse 13 to 17. uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind and may have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we will tell you what we will tell you that we who are still alive, who are still left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not deceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, angel, and with a trumpet call of God, and the dead from Christ will rise up. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. See so what it is? Those that remain. Are alive and remain, alive and remain, alive and remain, alive and remain. This is the key. Go to Luke chapter 21, verse 34. And you see the grand picture. It's you're gonna all eyes are gonna see him. He's gonna raise the dead. There are those that are alive, they're gonna change the moment of the twinkle of an eye. Remain. Hang in there with Christ. The whole world may forsake you. Remain in there with Christ. Luke 21, 34. Yeah, um, verse 34 to 36. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down without carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on the, all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy <clears throat> to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before them. Say standing and remaining. So don't be caught up in the craziness of this world, you guys. You know, and all this bizarre kind of chasing after nothing and vanity and simple childish pleasure, stuff like that. You have one thing to do. Man, be occupied with the work that God has in front of you and prepare yourself for that day. Now, what I'm not going to do, we're going to kind of wrap up our study here, is I have more to kind of tell you like thief of the night is also a hymn in the scripture is a thief has bad intentions. In, in one sense, you know, yeah, that was the bad intention part. Like if you get a Hosea and I could give you guys these verses, let me give you an example. For example, Hosea one verses one and two says, when I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is revealed and the evil deeds of Samaria for they deal falsely. The thief breaks in the bandits arrayed outside, but they do not consider that I will remember all their evil. Now their deeds surround them and they are all before my face. In other words, plundering they don't have good intentions job 24 14 the murderer rises before its light the killer that he may kill the poor and the needy and the night he is like a thief he comes in at night right the serial killer comes in at night uh, jeremiah 49 uh, 9 says if grape gatherers came to you would they not leave gleanings but if thieves came by night would they not destroy only enough for themselves obadiah says the same thing john 10 even says the thief comes to steal and to rob so we're seeing all this really highly negative stuff but the word thief in hebrew just to let you know it's very fascinating if you were to go to job let me read this to you in verse chapter 21 verse 18 you're gonna have a hard time finding the word thief there but it's the same word and let me see if you could figure it out how often is the lamp of the wicked put out? How often does their destruction come upon them? Like uh, they are like straw before the wind, like the chaff that a storm chases away. God lays up one's iniquity for the children. Let him recompense him. Basically, God's going into, he's going to judge them. They're going to be destroyed. The word a storm chases, uh, they're like chaff that a storm chases away is the word thief. He's coming to judge. And when he judges, it will be sure destruction. That is the context. It is bad news for one party. The party that's holding God's people hostage. Just ask Pharaoh how that worked out for him. Let my people go. No. Let my people go. 
No. I said, let my people go. No. This is not going to be good, right? And it wasn't good. It wasn't good. Even the book of, and this is what I really want to kind of think is very powerful. Isaiah 40, if you want, go to this. We'll kind of wrap up our study with these thoughts. Because Christ is a thief, but we're going to see what kind of thief he is. Satan. Yeah, he is a plunder of somebody's house. And he will not make any apologies. He's like chapter 49, verse 25 and 26. We're going to look at this very cool wrap up of our study of a very in, great insight into the kind Christ was crucified amongst two thieves. He said he was numbered with the transgressor, transgressors. Okay, you want to call me a thief? I'll show you what kind of thief I am. It's going to be kind of cool. He's a cool, he's a swashbuckling thief. He's cool. All right, Isaiah 49, verses 25 and 26. Whoever wants to read. But this is what the Lord says. Yes, captives will be taken from warriors and plundered, and plunder retreat from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you, and your children I will save. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh. They will be drunk on their own blood as with wine. Then all mankind will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, the Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. And it says that the prey of the terrible will be delivered. I don't know what your version says. But he will take out of the mouth the lamb from that lion. I will steal the capture of the predator out of that predator's mouth. And you are that lamb. Go ahead, go, but I want you to see what's interesting. This is an insight I think you're going to appreciate as we wrap up the study. Go to Proverbs chapter 6. Let's see what happens to thieves. This is very fascinating, you guys. Because there is consequence for being a thief. And Jesus says, all right, I'm a thief in the night. Let's let the consequences of a thief bear upon me. It's very interesting what we're going to see here. What is the penalty to a thief. And Christ says, all right, call me a thief. I'll deal with the penalty. Okay. Chapter 6, verses 30 and 31. Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it costs him all the wealth of his house. But a man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does... No, it's, yeah, what, is that 30 and 31? That's 31, 32. Yeah, go ahead and read verse 30. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy, satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Verse 31. Yet if he is caught, he must be seven hold, though it costs him all the wealth of his house. All the substance of his house. Men do not despise a thief if he steals, if he is what? Hungry. Christ was up on the cross, I thirst. He hungered. Who was he and what was he hungering for? You and me. He came to steal because he was hungry. But what was he hungry for? You. He hungered and thirsted after you. He panted after you. And he said, okay, what's the price of it? If I have to repay for my stealing, what is, what is the price? I'm going to restore it. I'm going to give the entire substance of my house. You guys, this is what the gift of salvation is. He's giving the substance of his house as recompense for his thievery. I'm going to give you everything because I stole you. It's pretty dramatic, right? I'm going to give you everything because you have to pay the thief's price. Right? In fact, go to Exodus 22, 7. Let's see where this law comes from. Exodus 22, 7. If a man delivers to his neighbor money while out of his receipt, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he will pay double. Ah, what's double fold? That's, you guys, that's the inheritance, man. <clears throat> Sorry, I got caught. You busted me. I stole. Guess I'm going to have to pay you guys double. You're going to have to get the substance of my house. You're going to have to get everything I own. 
That's the price of a thief. Yeah, go ahead. Crucify me between two thieves. I'm guilty. It's charged. What a plunderer. Pretty swashbuckling, pretty dramatic. He's going to pay. He's going to pay big for his thievery. I guess I got to give you guys everything. I guess that's the deal here. Is that pretty powerful, you guys? You know, it's really interesting real quick is I won't make you guys go to the verses, but if you go to like Matthew and Mark and you go to Luke, you should go to that sometime uh, and look at what happened with the thief on the cross. I want you guys to, to take time in that because they these two thieves were having a conversation with him and they were parting his garments. Did you know that the wick that's used for the seven branch candlestick was the garments of the priest? They would tear them up and they would dip them in oil, then they would light them. We're at the seven branch candlestick, and you'll see in Sardis, he's talking about the seven stars, the seven spirits. He's talking about thieves and garments. This is about seeing things. You got to see something about God, you got to see his side of him this thief side of him. He would rather give the substance of his house than let us be not stolen from somebody who legitimately stole us. By the way, Satan got us legally. We disobeyed. We transgressed. We fell under his dominion. We sold ourselves out for nothing. We Have, have you seen anyone sell themselves out for nothing? They've given everything over to their abuser. It's a horrible thing to get pimped like that. What's interesting here is Christ, as you're going to see, he's having a conversation with some thieves. He's having a thief conversation. And one thief says to the other thief, as Christ's garments are being torn up, this is the wick for this seven branch candlestick, believe it or not. Some insight, some light is happening there in this discussion. One thief says, hey, why don't you get us off this cross? But what does the other thief say to him? You said nothing wrong. You speak like an idiot, bro. We deserve to be here. He does. Yeah, we deserve this. We don't. There we go. We deserve this. He didn't. Don't you have any fear of God? Don't you have any insight at all? We deserve this. He never deserved it. Hey, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. As I tell you today. You will be with me in paradise. This is very powerful what's going on here, you guys. God is in the business of taking something out of the mouth of the jaw of this very ferocious beast called Satan. And he has no problem paying the price for it. I will give you everything I own as a recompense for stealing you. That's the price I'm going to pay. This is the plan of redemption. That is a great light to understand that. And what's interesting is the two thieves were on either side of Jesus. You know what's on either side of the breastplate of the high priest? A thing called a urum and a thummum. And do you know what thummum means? It's like to cease, to perfect something, to cut something off. Like when you're when you are like pruning bushes and you cut off that branch, that's thummum. No, we gotta we gotta cut that off. But do what Ura means? Light. It's the idea of being in the judgment, where you're in the light, where everything is exposed. Do you know where the thief that spoke up? Because if you want the approval of God, the Urim lights up. God says, I approve. Urim. And the light goes off. If you want God's approval, guess what thief spoke in defense of Jesus Christ? The thief on the right. Christ was approved of God. He was on the breastplate, resting upon the bosom of the Father. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Resting on your bosom. Tell me, what's the verdict? Which one lights up? The one on the right. The one on the right. Your judgment is going to be substance of the house, double portion. Amen? Wow. Talk about turning the lights back on. And he's telling Sardis, this is why the Son of Man was hanging between heaven and earth. You know, the whole Sardis stone. This is why he hung between heaven and earth. This is why he was crucified for you. So you can basically be snatched away by this swashbuckling husband thief man 
who's going to take you from the prey of the jaws of the lion. And this is so essential that you understand this, that by the time we go to Philadelphia and Laodicea, you're going to see two camps emerging. Sardis is the last few you get before you make your choice before Christ. And you're going to see these two camps open up here, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Laodicea means a people judged. Philadelphia is a people of brotherly love. And one is people of the kingdom, and one is kingdom of being spewed out and rejected of God. Sardis is the last stop. That's why it's so essential we understand this, you guys. It's the last view before you go into the Canaan land. It's hanging between heaven and earth. And there's something you got to see that he's being hung between two thieves and going, what's the significance of being hung between two thieves? Well, there's a thief there for you. What kind of thief is he? Well, he's kind of a good kind of thief. This thief is getting a bride out of the deal, going to plunder the household, and he's going to pay the price for it. What's the price for a thief, you guys? He's got to pay what? Double. Double. Everything. Everything he owns has got to now be yours. And Christ says, cool. I'll take it. That's a deal I'll live with. You guys, that's what you get when you want to understand Christ. And you really want to see the lights all turned on for you. You really want to stand in the midst of the seven branch candlestick. This is what you're going to see. And before, when we finally finish up with seven branch candlestick, the first thing you're going to see is Jesus Christ in the throne room slain as a lamb. And all the angels are going to be singing praises to him. This is why we're spending time in these seven branch candlesticks. We're going to have to make some circles until we're ready to really unpack the book of Revelation. This is an important orientation. You've got to see that this is the son of man hanging between heaven and earth. So you can be judged by God. As if you are going to get the plunder of the whole house of God. It is a guarantee. This is not some spiritual fuzzy stuff I'm telling you about. I'm trying to tell you, I believe 100% is literal. Jesus will literally come in the clouds of glory, you guys. Jesus will take us to a place that he has prepared for us. There will be mansions. We will be eating food. We will be with the Lord. We will be laughing and talking to one another literally. Not mystically, spiritually, in some metaphorical sense. I believe that he will show up. He will resurrect bodies, the whole shebang. And you're going to regret any moment you spent not preparing yourself for that day. It's sudden and it is shocking. You want shock and awe? There it is. That's why he knows humans wait till the last minute to do things. Yeah. Right? Twinkling of an eye, you're not going to have any time. Any you're time. sleeping. You're, you're in this kind of state of kind of dream state. And God reckons people that are, quote, children of the night as if they're weirdly living in a dream state. Just completely locked into this bizarre, enchanted, imaginary dream state that you're unable to uh, 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 wake yourself up. That's why in the parable of the, um, the bridegroom comes, you know, Matthew 25 stuff. It's right after Matthew 24. We just read all this Matthew 24 stuff. Go read Matthew 25 yourself where he separate, separates the sheep from the goats and he wakes up the, the five foolish and the five. You see all the separating in Matthew 25, the very next chapter. And then it says, but the bridegroom comes. Who wakes up the sleeping virgins? That's the part that people never talk about in the study. Somebody wakes them up. It says, behold, the bridegroom comes. Who's the waker uppers? It says there's watchmen on the wall making sure that it's time to wake up. And I am telling you, if I've devoted my life to anything, if I've sacrificed for anything for the last 30 years, it's to be a watchman on the wall. And I'm telling you, the bridegroom's coming. It's real. And this is the time to really say, God, wake me up. Get me prepared, whatever you got to do. Brotherly love or rich and increased of goods, you don't need anything. You decide. Amen? All right, guys, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that was promised. Thank you for turning on the lights in our own lives. I pray, dear God, that you do prepare us, that we're not caught unawares on that day. I pray, dear God, that as you speak to us, that it's not only here at this table, but it's the drive home and the time that we have by ourselves and with one another. Keep knocking on our door. Keep speaking to us. Keep whispering to us. 
Only you can prepare us for that day by nature, Lord. There's nothing in us that would make us perfect or, or innately ready on that day. Just let us put ourselves into your care, in your, your hands. Those very hands that were pierced and crucified for us, let us trust you and allow you to prepare us for that day, Lord. Whatever comes into our life, let us say, well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be that name. And then in the end, we'll receive that double portion. So give us patience, give us trust, give us hope, give us faith, give us an enduring spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, that was really good to, to remain. That's...